thanks everybody for showing up today. Um, my name is Art Matthews. I'm the mental health counselor here on campus. If you haven't met me already or seen my multiple emails or experienced some other reason to know me. Um, and I'd like to introduce to you Doreen Nicholas, who is a trainer with the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. Doreen has worked in social work and advocacy for over 25 years. Um, she's presented educational programs to the City of Phoenix and is currently working on the Roadmap to Excellence with the City of Phoenix. Um, and she's also presented to higher education institutions and professional conferences. Besides providing direct services to people impacted by sexual and domestic violence, uh, ACES DV, which is the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, promotes public awareness through information, training, awareness campaigns, events in the media. Their training department provides training on dynamics and responses to sexual and domestic violence as well as other related topics. And their training attendance typically includes sexual and domestic violence advocates, social workers, healthcare providers, sexual assault nurse examiners, faith-based leaders, child welfare providers, law enforcement, etc. <coughs> so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Doreen. Um, oh, one, one little piece of ado. We would like to thank you very much for coming and award you with a certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Um, this is National Stalking Awareness Month, and we wanted to help uh, thank you for helping us with that acknowledgement. Thank you very so, much. This is Making the Connection Intimate Partner Violence in Healthcare. And I know it's Stalking Violence Awareness Month, um, and Stalking, if you got one of these statute lists, I'll talk about that in a minute, but stalking is a standalone crime. Um, and we don't really have a law addressing domestic violence, but for this stat statute that you see here in ARS 13-3601. Um, and when we talk about sexual assault, stalking, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, are, there's a lot of overlap unless it's actually some stranger, stereotypical chest of the molester guy with the trench coat hiding in the bushes, you know, waiting to flash somebody kind of person. Or somebody that's, um, you know, psychotically obsessed with someone, you know, a, a star or some public figure. Um, stalking is a domestic violence crime. Um, it goes hand in hand many times with sexual violence crimes. But how many of you have an idea of when we started to address domestic violence in Arizona and around our country legally? When we started to view it as perhaps criminal behavior? What year? 1980. Right on the button, 1980. That was a total guess. Yeah. That was a good guess. That was a good guess. <laughs> Up until 1980, whatever happened behind closed doors was a private family matter. And tragically, we still have people in positions of power in our courts and in law enforcement who still view it as being a private family matter. So the response many times to domestic violence situations isn't as um, enthusiastic as we would like it to be. Um, but when our statute first went on the books in 1980, it just covered aggravated assault and it just covered people who were married. So as you can see by this list of crimes, now on our law books, all of these crimes individually are standalone crimes. They were gathered together under this heading of 13-3601 to address domestic violence. So since 1980, it's expanded quite a bit to actually more accurately reflect the experiences of, of victims in abusive relationships. So as you can see, it's expanded to include dangerous crimes against children, murder and homicide, uh, endangerment, threats and intimidation, assault, aggravated assault, custodial interference, kidnapping, sexual assault, um, interfering with judicial proceedings, that means violating an order of protection, um, disorderly conduct, a couple of new ones that they moved under this heading are 2910A8 and A9, the neglect and abandonment or cruel mistreatment of an animal. 
Now, why do you think they'd do that? <coughs> why do you think that would be moved under this? You can't answer, Art. <laughs> why do you think? Because they're doing it to get back at the person. Oh, you, if you leave me, I'm going to kill your dog or they're torturing the animal in front of the person. Yeah. But one of the things we do at the coalition is we collect the information on domestic violence related deaths in the state. And we're still finishing up 2014, but in 2013, we had 125 people die in Arizona because of domestic violence. Year before that, 139. That means that they died at the hands of an intimate partner or a family member. Um, and the staff member that's putting that list together, I walked by her office the other day and she was in tears because she was adding Wiggles the dog to the list. Um, and at some point last summer, there was a case in the Valley where this woman left her abusive boyfriend, but wherever she went, she couldn't take the dog with her. Um, and the day after she left, and this is July, you know, 199 degrees, he left the dog out of the backyard with no water, no food, and he was sending her texts and pictures for like three days straight. If you don't come back, I'm gonna kill the dog. If you don't come back, the dog's gonna die. If you don't come back, the dog's gonna die of dehydration. You know, so day three, you know, she would plead, don't do that, don't do that. Um, so third day she finally went to the cops um, and you know they used the texts and the pictures that he sent her as evidence to file those charges plus um, 2916 use of an electronic communication to terrify intimidate threaten or harass right then general threatening and intimidating behavior um, so when in 1980, it went on the books and it just covered married couples and it just covered aggravated assault. It didn't include any of these other things that victims experience. So we've expanded and improved the way we can legally respond to domestic violence. Now, if you look on the back of it. Was there a particular case that got it into law in 1980? I mean, was there a case law that brought it to the? It was kind of like a domino effect across the country. Okay. Um, for the previous 15 years, advocates and survivors had been approaching Congress. Department of Health and Human Services actually is the, the federal agency that got it started. They provided seed money for each state to develop coalitions like ours. Um, shelters were starting to emerge, the domestic violence shelters. Um, and so when our coalition in Arizona went into effect in 1980, from 80 to 89, the first nine years, it was all run on volunteer steam. Just Concerned community members wanted to do something. 89, we paid our first staff person part-time. And then when I came on in 98, I was staff number five. And today we're almost 20 staff. We've expanded to address sexual assault, the sexual assault nurse examiners, the sexual assault response teams around the state, et cetera. So you bet. But a lot was happening in the um, 80s and 90s, and then the Violence Against Women Act was passed in 1994, which made it a federal crime if you cross state lines to stalk somebody, hurt somebody, violate an order of protection, et cetera. The Violence Against Women Act also um, provided the funding for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which you'll see on those little shoe cards if you grabbed one of those. That's a 24-hour seven day a week hotline for victims, family members, friends, service providers. Their staff knows upwards of 62 languages, um, so it, it's very helpful. Um, but on the back of that um, statute handout, you can see, see our statute's a two part statute. So one part of the statute is to confirm that one of those crimes has been committed. The second part of the statute is to um, verify the relationship between the people. So it's moved quite a bit beyond just covering married people. She's got something for you. Um, so you can see under number one, the relationship um, is one of marriage or former marriage or of persons residing or having resided in the same household. So it was either 12 or 13 years ago, we changed the language on number one because it used to say persons of the opposite sex. So we took the opposite sex language out, so now it says persons residing or having resided. Now it covers folks in same-sex relationships that live together. Um, number two, it talks about the victim and defendant have a child in common. You can have a child with somebody and not live together, not have been married, not, you know. Um, three, the victim or defendant is pregnant by the other party, same thing. You don't have to live together or been married. Number four talks about being related by blood or marriage. So it includes child, grandchild, brother, sister, step-grandparent, etc. 
Number five talks about stepchildren or a child who's been legally adopted through the court. And number six, we're going to talk about that in just a second. I jumped way ahead of myself, so be patient. I do that. Um, CDC gives us a lot of good statistics. They just finished their intimate partner, um, intimate partner violence survey in 2010, and they published the results in 2012, but that's where this information came from, their 2010 study. One in four American women report being abused sexually or physically by a male or female partner at some point in their lives. One in seven American men report physical or sexual violence by a male or female partner at some point in their lives. This is our definition of domestic violence that we use, that it's a pattern of abusive behaviors. This is what makes it different from a stranger crime. It's a pattern of behaviors. And it's a pattern of behaviors because in an intimate partnership or a family, the perpetrator has opportunity and access. So it can develop into this pattern sometimes very subtly. Um, I mean, it's not like, you know, first date, somebody comes up to your door and before they came up to your door, they slashed your tires and then they, you answered the door, they gave you flowers and they punched you out and threw you down and raped you. That's not how it develops in an abusive relationship. Usually during the courtship phase, abusers are just as charming and smell just as good and walk just as good and talk just as good as the next person. A lot of abusive people say that they started the blatant kinds of abuse and control after the commitment was made, after they're married, moved in together, or one was pregnant by the other. So it's a pattern of abusive behaviors in any relationship that's used to gain and maintain power and control over another intimate partner. Those are important um, dynamics to remember. We're talking about this. That power and control. This kind of lays out the tactics that are used. <clears throat> so besides what's addressed on the statute list, what a lot of people talk about experiencing is, is intimidation. And if you look at these tactics on the inside of the wheel, intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, the isolation is, you know, keeping you from going to school or going to work or not letting you have lunch with your sister or trying to control how you do your hair or if you wear makeup or not or how you walk and talk and how you dress and what kind of music you listen to, etc. cetera. Um, so isolation, minimizing, denying and blaming their behavior. You know, I didn't, I was just playing. You know, quit your crying, I'll give you something to cry about. I was just playing around. You get hysterical so easily. And then using the children. You know, it's real easy to control somebody through their children. Turn to take the kids, use the other kid against the other, you know, parent. Then economic abuse, male privilege in some traditionally structured relationships, that's a dynamic where, you know, I'm the master of the castle, I get to make all the big decisions, and this is men's work, this is women's work, etc. But I'm not saying that I have anything against traditional relationships, because I've seen a lot of traditional relationships where everything's happy. The difference is that that couple sat down and decided together. You work, I'll stay home and take care of the kids in the house, and you know, they both decided that. Where it crosses over into abuse is when that's imposed upon another person, and they don't have a say in that decision. You do this my way or else. That's where it crosses over into abuse. Now, if you take the gender out of there, what are some other ways that you can get the upper hand in a relationship? What, you can get privilege in a relationship. Physical size, withholding sex, withholding money. Yeah, if one person makes more money than the other one, they can use that as the rationale to make all the financial decisions and control the money, right? Property ownership, well, this is my house. It's my house, yeah. yeah. If one person has a, a better education than the other. I mean, all it takes is one well-placed uh, comment like, well, what do you know, Art? You didn't even graduate high school. I'm the one with a degree. I mean, not only was that mean as hell, but it let him know that I looked at him as less than me, right? So it gives you the upper hand. And the more power one person has over the other, the more imbalanced that relationship gets. And then if you've got somebody that's afraid of you and they're starting to feel bad about themselves because of the names that they've been called, you know, you're stupid, fat, and ugly, nobody will ever want you, you're lucky I even blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you keep them from their support network. And then if they've already hurt you, the coercion and threats 
are many times enough to control you. And then if you do try to go to school or get a job or have lunch with your sister, that might be when it escalates to the physical or sexual violence. Or sometimes, for some abusers, not all, when they're under the influence. In some cases, drugs and alcohol can escalate the frequency and severity of the abuse. Okay, but you can do all those things in the inside of this wheel to somebody without touching them. And that's why the, the statute list had to expand to include the threats and intimidation, using the telephone and electronics to terrify, harass, annoy, or offend somebody. And the newest one we added to that list was the last one, 1425. When it was going through the legislature last year, it was known as the revenge porn bill. Unlawful distribution of images, state of nudity. So Art and I are in a relationship. In the beginning of the relationship, it was wonderful. We took little videos of each other, little photographs of each other, and various states of undress for our own enjoyment, right? And then he broke up with me. And that really pissed me off. So I started sending those little photographs and videos to his grandma, his boss, his pastor, put them up on Facebook to humiliate him, you know? Um, and that happens in more relationships than we know, especially in this day and age of technology. So that got successfully passed last legislative session, and it's a domestic violence bill, a uh, statute, and it's also a sex crime statute, okay? Now it is under review by the ACLU to make sure it doesn't infringe on any free speech um, kind of uh, grounds, but we're pretty confident that it's gonna stand. <clears throat> So that's something to keep in mind, that, that it kind of gives you an idea of how this pattern of behavior goes into place sometimes very subtly in relationships. Because you don't want to say to anybody, well, why are you with somebody like that? And it's not like they had a big A for abuser tattooed on their head, you know? It's not like you can pick them out of the crowd. I mean, you look around the room and you're looking at the faces of victims and abusers in our society. They look like normal, regular people. There's, there's no distinguishing them from any other person. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the last relationship um, category that was added, number six. It used to be people that were dating, whether they were teens or adults, weren't covered under our statute. Um, that was added in 2009 because of a a teen Moon Valley High School student named Katie Sudbury. Um, she came to her mom and said, I'm breaking up with Daniel because he's being mean to me and he's frightening me, etc." cetera. So um, Katie's mom, Bobby, took her down to the court to get an order of protection and they were informed that um, all they could get was a harassment injunction. They weren't covered under our statute. Um, so. Uh, a harassment injunction doesn't have as many teeth as an order of protection does. A order of protection, you can ask for exclusive use of the resident. You can ask that firearms be turned over. You can ask that your partner goes to counseling. You can ask for emergency child support, all kinds of things on an order of protection. Um, a harassment injunction is something that I'd get against Art if he was my neighbor and his dog kept coming over and pooping on my lawn. I'd get a harassment injunction. He'd be served with it, saying, keep your dog off my lawn, or we'll go into court. It's just a keep away kind of order, not like an order of protection. So anyways, Katie and her mom got the harassment injunction and Daniel was served with it. And three days after he was served with it, he was waiting for her when she was walking home from school with a double barrel shotgun and shot and killed her, then killed himself. So after Bobby got through with the bulk of her grieving and could think halfway straight, she got a hold of us and we put her in touch with a lawmaker that helped craft the language that you see on number six on here, um, added it to cover people in dating relationships, even if it's a one night stand, that they had a romantic or a sexual relationship. Um, and that's what we've been doing a lot at ASU and Mesa Community College and Grand Canyon University, is talking about um, dating violence and, and those kind of things. Um, especially with the passage of the Clary Act and the Violence Against Women Act expanded. So all those things we need to be aware of. But, you know, as far as you all go, in Family Violence Prevention Fund and Futures Without Violence put out those shoe cards, they've got all kinds of great information on domestic violence and healthcare, whether it's 
um, OBGYN or general practitioners or dentists or whatever. They, they started the work on domestic violence and healthcare um, 20 some years ago. But I want you to be clear that domestic violence is not caused by any of these things. And a lot of people think they are. And our courts are still fudging on this. Um, some judges, some of the ones that probably need to retire, but some judges will look at a police report and if they see that the abuser particularly was under the influence, they'll sentence the abuser to A or drug treatment program that first, for that first time. So what do you think that does? It gives you a sober abuser. Gives you a sober abuser who's probably got better aim. <laughs> That's exactly it. Or they'll sentence them to anger management. It's not caused by anger. And we've heard this from law enforcement for years. Law enforcement tell us that when they approach a, a domestic violence call, they'll listen outside the window or the door for a couple seconds just to see what, if they can hear what's going on, just get a little bit more information before they announce their presence. And they say it sounds like Freddy Krueger's in there, roaring and bellowing and crashing and banging and screaming and carrying on. And then cops will knock on the door and say, police, open up. And if the perpetrator answers the door, what do you think the cops see? Good evening, officer. How can I help you? It's not an anger problem. They turn that on and off like a light switch. They use it as another one of those tactics. That goes under the intimidation category on that power and control wheel. I mean, if somebody's in your face yelling and screaming and carrying on, you're going to do what you need to do to calm them down, right? And, and that's exactly what happens. But in the face of authority, in the courtroom, in church, they're wonderful people. I worked with this one woman one time who um, said she came home late from work a couple minutes. So she did some small transgression, according to her partner. But he had her in the corner of the living room, and he was, you know, blah, 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 and spit was flying and carrying on. And every once in a while, he'd thump her in the forehead with his finger, or thump her in the chest with his finger, and rah, 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 rah. And then the doorbell rang. And he said, wait right here. I'll be right back. So he went to the door and it was the Girl Scouts. And he's like, hi girls, how you doing? Blah, 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 blah. And the scout leader's at the end of the sidewalk. And um, he said, what kind of cookies you got? He bought like six boxes of cookies. He's telling the girls what neighbors might buy cookies, etc. Wished them good luck. Closed and locked the door, went right back and picked up where he left off with his wife. So they use it as another abusive tool. When Perpetrators get sentenced to anger management, and usually it's no more than six anger management classes. What they tell us, and we talk to them all the time, as much as we can. We talk to perpetrators about what works for you, what doesn't. They tell us that the only thing they get out of anger management classes is they learn new and exciting things from the other fellows in group, stuff they hadn't thought of yet to use against <coughs> their partners. So it's not about anger. It's not caused by anger, substance abuse, or mental illness. I'm sure all of us know somebody with a mental health diagnosis who's not dangerous, right? What you're actually looking at is a list of excuses that abusers use. We're not born with a violence gene. I imagine all of you are stressed out. You're probably not beating up your partners or your children. And if you are, don't tell me because I have to report it, OK? Um, our relationships. Relationships are hard. They're hard. We struggle in our relationships. but. A lot of times we struggle in love and together and supporting each other. We're not afraid of each other, right? This is a list of the excuses that abusers use. What we do know is that it's a learned behavior. It's learned through observation, reinforced in society many times. And one of the interesting things I, I learned about our culture shifting when I was listening to NPR this morning is that we probably aren't going to see as many scantily clad women in Super Bowl ads. People are starting to recognize that maybe that's objectifying women a little bit. I mean, it's taken us a while to get there, but we're going to have more puppies, <laughs> less skin. It's a shift in culture. I mean, it really is. Because that whole power and control dynamic is about ownership. And I'm not going to put my feminist hat on or anything today, but anyways, it's all tied in together. It's a choice. They have the ability to control who their victims are. They're usually not beating up their neighbors or their coworkers or classmates or anybody else, right? 
and it's used to gain power and control and instill fear in their partner. Now this stalking activity usually kicks in after the relationship has ended. Because usually it's ended for the victim partner, but not for the perpetrator partner. And a lot of times it escalates the fear and the danger in that relationship. So hopefully you've created an environment here and you'll create an environment in your practices or wherever you go that if it's going on, somebody can talk to you about it. Um, another good source for awareness material is the Futures Without Violence um, organization. They have posters, healthcare related posters. Yeah, that's on that handout. Um, they've got healthcare related posters. They've got those shoe cards. We always talk to healthcare professionals about creating an environment where if it's going on with somebody, they'd be more likely to talk to you about it because you've got a poster up that addresses it. You ask on every screening about it, right? Yes? Do you ask when the partner's in the room? We're going to get to that. <laughs> We've got, I've got a whole screening section here. Um, I want you to think about the five most important things in your life. And right now, you don't have to write them down necessarily unless you want to. And if you've got five puppies or five kids, it's not fair to write them down individually. But just five areas of your life that are really important to you. Anybody got one or two they want to share? Marriage. Your marriage is important? Yeah, fiance Ma and school. Fiance and school. Relationship with my children. Relationship with your children. Faith. Your faith. Health. Your health. Family. Family. Could you work with? Yeah. Those things that you identified as being important to you are, are many times the things that victims have to think about leaving behind when they end their relationships. It might not be safe to go back to the church. You might have to leave school or go to another school because your partner might go to the same school and know your schedule and everything, right? You might live on one of those streets or neighborhoods where grandma lives around the corner and your sister lives across the street and everybody's right there, but it's not safe to stay in your home. Your partner might take you to court and start a custody battle and you might lose custody of your kids to your partner. So when victims leave, they, they have to make those kind of decisions and face those kind of realities. That a lot of that stuff they, they might have to leave behind. And you know, I know that you know, as, as medical people, y'all are highly advanced and evolved, and you probably embrace change with wide open arms, right? No. We bitch and complain, and we put it off, and we do this, and we do that, and we make the change at the last minute when we have to, right? I want you to keep in mind that when a victim of violence is, leaves an abusive relationship, everything in their life is changing at once when they walk out the door. Their standard of living, if they have a car or not, if they have health care insurance or not, all those things are changing when they leave. But invariably, I still get this question, why, doesn't, why don't they just leave? And I'll tell you right now, this question is so 80s. It's so 80s. I mean, think about it. That's when 75% of our domestic violence related deaths occur at that point of, point of trying to end the relationship or just after they've left the relationship. Why do you think that would be the most dangerous time? They feel like they're losing power, so they're trying to regain it. And the ultimate act of control is to take somebody's life. Sadly, the last thing a lot of victims hear is, if I can't have you, and if you're not going to be with me, Now that sucks that you guys know the rest of those two statements. Why do you know the rest of those two statements? Lifetime movies. <laughs> Lifetime movies. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's part of that because the awareness raising that Lifetime does, they do a lot of good stuff about sexual violence and domestic violence, etc. But there's a lot of material out there, movies, 
video games and otherwise that portray unhealthy relationships. These obsessive, obsessive types of relationships that I can't live without you kind of thing, right? Um, we don't have a lot of healthy relationship information out there and we need to do that for our kids. And that's one of the, I'm, I'm going to Kansas week after next just for that, for a prevention conference to talk about getting more information about healthy relationships in our, our schools for our kids. So they feel like they're losing control, they try to regain control, they feel like their life is over. So a lot of them kill their partners and their children and the family dog and anybody that tries to help. So it's a very dangerous situation. And if a person is trying to get out of that relationship and they call the police, will they escort them to, the, to, the, to their house to get their supplies, to get their kids, to get their dog, whatever? Will they help them leave that situation? Sometimes they will if you're ready to leave, if there's a, shelter, a space in the shelter to go to, if you have some place to go to. Yeah. Sometimes when police respond, victims are hysterical, and some cops don't have patience for that. A lot of law enforcement agencies have um, an advocate that responds with them. So the advocate can stay behind and help them with safety planning, linking to shelters and other services they need. This is a more productive way of trying to figure it out, is trying to identify the barriers to someone leaving. What's making it so hard for them to leave? Especially if they've said they want to leave, I'm, I can't take this anymore, I want to do something. A lot of times these are the barriers they're up against. Where am I going to stay? I don't have enough money to take care of me and my children. Um, they might be afraid of their partner. Because not only has that abuse been going on, but usually threats too. If you leave me, if you try to take my kids away, if you do this, if you do that, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. So they've got the abuse. They've got the threats on top of that. Um, and I've got another component to add to that in just a second. So they're afraid. They might be ashamed that they can't keep the family together or make the relationship work. It might be against their religion. You know. I, and when I worked in the shelter, I would face that all the time when married women came in. They would say, I, I took these vows. And I'd say, wait a minute. I think both of you took the vows, right? And I think those vows were broken the first time they hurt you or frightened you, right? And I think that part of your vows till death do us part doesn't mean by the, at the hands of your partner. I think it means by natural causes. So, it, but it was a real struggle for, for a lot of folks. Because most people don't want their relationships to end. They want the crap to end. They want the violence to end, right? Um, they don't want their children to go without. They, they don't want their kids to be from a broken family. They want their kids to have both parents. Um, geographically, I mean, we've got 22 recognized tribes in Arizona. And some of our tribal lands are in very remote locations. A lot of poverty, not a lot of resources, usually smaller law enforcement departments. So sometimes geography is a barrier to leaving, especially if they don't have access to a phone, a vehicle, etc. Um, employment, if they have a job or not. For some of our undocumented folks, their residency status is a real barrier for them. Lack of support, because if they're isolated from their family members and friends, they're kind of estranged from them. Afraid of the escalation of abuse. They may still love their partner. They want to believe those promises to change. Again, marriage vows, better or worse. Richer or poorer, la, la, la. It's been a long time, I forgot. Um, afraid of further violence against children and pets, social norms, and then just a general lack of resources. But what makes it hard to, and this is where you guys come in as healthcare professionals. So they've been abused, they've been threatened, if you leave, I'm gonna do this. They've also been told that nobody's gonna believe you, nobody's gonna help you, and nobody cares about you. And one of the, the words over the door when I walked in that jumped out at me was compassion. You're going to be working with people that are hurting, you know, whether it's a, a tooth or whether it's some other kind of issue. But they haven't been treated with compassion for a very long time, so it's important they get it from someplace. And usually that first response when they reach out for help sets the stage for future help seeking. If they get somebody that's impatient or judgmental or whatever, I, I worked with this one woman who called the cops and the cop said, you know, if you guys don't quiet down and we have to come back out here, we're going to arrest both of you. She didn't call the cops for another eight years. 
right? So that first response when they tell somebody, when they're brave enough to, to open up about what's going on, especially the threats if you tell anybody, if you call the police, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, it's huge on how you respond to them. So that's an important thing to remember. So it overlaps into dating violence and teen pregnancy, right? Adolescent girls in physically abusive relationships were 3.5 times more likely to become pregnant than non-abused girls. And this is where sexual violence overlaps. A lot of the domestic violence victims, almost 100% of the domestic violence victims we work with are also sexual violence victims. Because if you're afraid of your partner, if fear is in the room, consent is not possible. And for it to be an equal, healthy, consensual sexual relationships, it's got to be okay for you to say no without fear of injury or reprisal, right? So that's the dynamic that's happening with teen girls a lot of the times. They're afraid to say no. A lot of times reproductive coercion is a part of abusive relationships, pregnancy coercion. Threats or acts of violence if the partner does not comply with the perpetrator's wish wishes regarding the decision whether to terminate or continue a pregnancy. So that happens a lot. That's a dynamic. So there's a lot of different settings where we could be asking about this, right? The birth control sabotage, these are tactics used by intimate partner perpetrators. Destroying or disposing of contraceptives, impeding condom use, threatening to leave her, poke holes in the condoms, not allowing her to obtain or preventing her from using birth control, and threatening physical harm if she uses contraceptives. So that dynamic could be in play. So how do we ask? Violence is a problem. We want to do it, make it universal screening. It's a problem for many women and families because it affects health and well-being. I ask all my patients about it. Considerations for minors. Now, there's a mandatory reporting requirement for minors, right? Tell the minor about the limits of confidentiality. Everything you tell me is confidential unless you tell me someone's hurt you or made you do something sexual you didn't want to do. Put it right up front. And if you put it right up front, instead of trying to be cagey about it, that gives that person an opportunity to make the decision that's best for them. Is it time for me to talk about it or not? Who must report? You guys know this. Medical personnel, health professional, psychologist, counselor, peace officer, blah, 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 blah. Any person responsibility for the care or treatment of a minor. Um, this is our statute addressing it. ARS 13-3620. Just so you know. So if a minor divulges to you, Remember when I told you there's some things I'd have to report? This is one of those things. But you do have choices. You can be here when I make the call, and I can tell them that you want to what you want to have happen next. We can tell them what the safest way is to tell your parents. Does any of that sound like something you want to do? Again, it keeps them involved in making choices for themselves. That's real important, especially if you've been disempowered or controlled by an abusive partner. It's important to look at patterns of injuries. A lot of times the injuries aren't going to match the story they give you because, again, they've been threatened with not to tell, right? And a lot of victims have told me if they only ask me directly, because I can't lie, I wouldn't be telling, I'd be answering a question. That's how they rationalized it. If somebody had asked me directly, so scratches, welts, bruises at multiple stages. And sometimes you'll see people who might have injuries in various stages of healing who weren't allowed to get health care. Their partner kept them from going to the doctor or going to the emergency room. They might have old fractures and stuff. Um, burns, chipped or knocked out teeth, lacerations, and knife wounds. Now, there is another reporting statute for healthcare professionals that you guys have to report um, gunshot wounds, knife wounds, or other material injuries. Material is kind of gray, but that would include broken bones, those kind of things. But that was originally put on the books to deal with the gang violence. Because a lot of times there'd be gang activity and the gang members would drop their buddy off at the emergency room and drive off. 
and cops wouldn't have anything to go on how this gunshot or this knife wound happened. But this also covers domestic violence um, victims. But you've got to find out what your policy is and have a procedure in place in, in your healthcare setting. Because if we can't connect a victim with a social worker or give them time to make some kind of plan, it might make it real dangerous for her when we report or him when we report if we haven't helped her get something in place. Does that make sense? So check what the reporting requirement is in regards to domestic violence. Because some, in regards to that statute, gunshot wound, knife wounds, and other material injuries have set up a whole separate procedure for domestic violence reporting. Um, Maricopa Integrated Health System and a couple other hospitals in the valley did a strangulation pilot program. And when they started asking specifically, has someone, has your partner or someone in your life ever choked you? And that's the word they use because victims related better with the choking word. And once they started asking it, the reporting of it went up 50%. And you know what can happen with strangulation. I just saw the Hunger Games Catching Fire one, mm -hmm. and where PETA strangles her. They did a really good job. She had the petechia going on and everything. But that's something to pay attention to. Also, is a lot of times they won't report that. They forget in the fury of the moment. Head injuries, too. A lot of times they've gotten knocked around or smacked in the head and just, you know, we're OK. So they didn't think about it, but they still could have some traumatic brain injury from that. Doesn't take much. <clears throat> so screening. Screening and initial responses should be conducted by staff educated on dynamics of domestic violence, issues of victim safety and autonomy, trained how to screen, assess, and document the abuse, and to provide information referrals to community resources. And who are authorized to write in medical records as documentation is important. A lot of times when victims want to follow through with prosecution, your medical documentation is key for those cases. Defining success in addressing domestic violence is to make sure it's a safe environment for disclosure. Like I said, having little piles of those shoe cards around, having um, posters up, making sure it's a part of every screening, how are things, how are things at home, what's going on, you know, just creating that relationship. Give supportive messages, educate about the health effects of intimate partner violence, strategies to promote safety, inform about community resources. You know, when in, in your healthcare setting, for instance, when you know these issue months are coming around, you could have a little info table. Everybody could be wearing a ribbon. A lot of times that starts the conversation. I can't tell you over the years how many times, you know, I forget to take my ribbon off and I'm going to the grocery store and people will say, well, I know what the pink ribbon's about and I know what the red ribbon's about. What's the purple one or what's the teal one about? And then that's my opportunity to talk about domestic violence and, or sexual violence and, you know. But that sometimes starts the conversation. If you just have those things around, have a little awareness table for stalking. February's Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. April's Child Abuse Awareness Month and, and Sexual Violence Awareness Month. October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So when those kind of things roll around, you can have that information available. Screening should not be done if you can't ensure an appropriate response to people who may disclose. This is a good phrase to remember. If you, if you screen, be prepared to intervene. Don't just say, OK, thank you, and write it up in their chart and say, you know, see you next time. Make sure there's a social worker. Make sure you have a relationship with the closest shelter. Make sure you've got a shoe card. Thank you for telling me. I know that was hard, et cetera. These, of these questions, when you look these over real quickly, no one's hurting you, right? You aren't being abused, are you? Have you been experiencing any domestic violence? Are you being abused by your partner? Are you safe in your home? Which one of those do you think is the best question to ask? Are you safe in your home? Yeah. If you look over your screening tools and it says, are you a victim of domestic violence? Just scratch that one. Nobody wants to be a victim. of They're going to say no. Are you safe in your home? That kind of opens the door. Now, I've got a pediatrician friend at Maricopa Integrated Health System, and she was all proud of herself because she, do you feel safe in your home? That's her question. And she used to get regular 
you know, a lot better responses from asking that question. But one day, she thought she had a, a crisis on her hand. She asked that question, do you, do you feel safe in your home? And the woman said, no. And she was like, oh my god, what's going on? Um, well, the woman said, well, we just moved closer to the river, and every morning when I wake up, there's some kind of critter on my back porch. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was kind of funny. but So every once in a while, you know, she gets a, <laughs> thrown for a loop. But those other ones, I mean, those other ones, you know, the first two, you're telling them you want to know answer because you don't want to deal with it, right? And are you experiencing domestic violence? So many people have different definitions of what they think domestic violence is, right? So are, being, are you being abused by your partner? That depends on the relationship you have with that patient. But the best general question is that last one. Are you safe in your home? What should you do when you get a positive disclosure of domestic violence? Say supportive things like, I'm sorry this is happening in your life. You don't deserve it. It's not your fault, and I'm worried about the safety of you and your children. Just simple, caring statements. And this, this stuff, this starts to counter that stuff that their partner told them, that nobody cares about you, nobody's going to believe you, nobody's going to help you. That immediately starts to counter that message. Use your radar, and that means routinely screen every patient, ask directly, kindly, and non-judgmentally, document your findings, assess the patient's safety, review options, and provide referrals. These are some websites that you can find a lot of good information. Ours at the top, um, you'll find a lot of the information that I brought today, plus a whole listing of all the shelters, safe homes around the state, local and national hotline numbers. Futures Without Violence has the healthcare response to domestic violence information, plus posters, shoe cards, and stuff that you can get. National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, that's our national agency. National Network to End Domestic Violence, they've got a program called Safety Net, and that talks about technology safety. Because with all the new technology and ever changing, if you've got a tech savvy perpetrator, they can download some stalking apps on your phone and you won't even know it. There's a lot of stalking apps out there that are advertised as keeping your kids safe or keeping watch over your elderly mother. But a lot of stalkers saw the potential in those apps. And they can download them on their partner's phone and they won't even show up. And if you're not familiar with the technology, it's easy to do. So they've got a whole safety net program that has some tech safety tips for folks working with victims or for victims themselves. And then the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence is a good place to go to look for information. OK. Whew. That was quite a ride. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, I have a friend who was married to a police officer. They're, they're divorced, but he still threatens her. The thing is, he works in one precinct. She doesn't <laughs> live in that area, so how does she I've, I've told her to just follow up. Or is she in the state or out of the state? She's in the state. So <clears throat> he threatens her, and I know that in the Does she have documentation of those threats? Yeah, phone. But when she's filed reports, they somehow disappear with the police department. So One thing she could do is go to ASPOST, which is the Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. That's what keeps his law enforcement credentialing. And he could lose his credentialing if he keeps that up. So she could talk to them at ASPOST because that's a whole separate entity from his precinct or the courts there. Okay. They, they credential all law enforcement officers in the state, including tribal um, sheriffs, departments, etc. So she could talk to somebody there off the record and find out what steps she takes. Has she actually gone to the court desk and filed paperwork? She has. And Did they, they give her just, copies of the paperwork that she filed and it disappears? Nothing's done about it? I know that she's filed reports and they disappear. No, not reports, just, not report, yeah. like an actual like yeah. An injunction. Yeah, because when she's Order protection, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, tell her, tell her elevate to the Attorney General's office because a lot of times the courts are making that disappear. Attorney General's office will. So there's one thing to file a report when he threatens her. Mm -hmm. And she should always get a copy of those reports, especially if there's a history of them disappearing. Mm -hmm. But also, if she's gotten the order of protection for him to stay away, has she? Mm -hmm. To stay away and leave him alone and he keeps violating it? Yes. Okay. 
then, she, then right, go to the attorney general's office and say, X, Y, and Z is happening and nobody's doing anything about it. Or go back to the judge that filed the paperwork and say, I keep filing reports and the police, they keep disappearing. He keeps, I've got all this information and the judge can help with all things. Okay. One of the other things you can do is call here that's my extension, don't call me. But call the, num <laughs> call the number in general and ask for a legal advocate because we've got legal advocates on our hotline that'll walk her through the things that I just told you she could do and, and that he suggested, but they'll help her and they'll help her safety plan, they'll help her with the documentation and next steps. Okay. But it's that number and ask for a legal advocate, okay? Any other questions or comments? This has been fantastic. Right on. We thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.